every moment of my life, every moment of my life, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, I leave these earthly things. So I will listen to your word. Display my faithfulness so true. Because you gave your life for me, now I will give my life to you. To you. Greetings in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ. This is the Know Your Bible broadcast on Church Media TT, the YouTube channel. Once again, God has given us this divine privilege to come into your homes, wherever you may be at this time. We trust that you will have this document presented to you as it is in truth, which is the Bible, the Word of God, the inspired Word of God. And I use the term document to indicate that when you have writings put together that is so explicit, that is so unique, that is so inspirational, we cannot deny every page, every word written. Because why? It is God's word. It is God's document. It is the, the pattern of which he has designed and arranged all things for us to learn, to understand, and to come to know who he is and to really and truly give him the honor, glory, and praise. So as we go through these lessons continuously, what we'll be doing is just turning from the pages of the Bible and learning from the things in which God has in store for us. If you are joining us for the first time, we welcome you to this wonderful New Year Bible program. We pray that you will continue to reach out to your friends, to your neighbors, because this program brings to you the Bible in its simplicity in understanding how we can be drawn closer to God in obedience to the wonderful gospel of Christ. I trust that you had a wonderful and prosperous week that has gone by. If not, I pray that you look forward to blessings coming your way this week and may God truly uplift your spirit and encourage your hearts. Before we go into our lesson, I kindly ask of you to join with me as we go before our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, which are in heaven, the one who knows and sees all things, the one who is all-powerful, the one who is present anywhere and everywhere, the one whom we continue to look towards because you are the only true and living God and there's no other like you. We pray, Father, as we continue to read, to search, and to study your words, that you would help us to be drawn closer to you. We pray, Father, for those who are considering turning their lives around, that the hindrances of the enemy called Satan would, would not deter them from obeying your wonderful words, but that you would make the way possible for them to come to know you and to be obedient. Father, we pray for members of the church that they would be strengthened in facing many obstacles and challenges every day, that we'll always live by faith, trusting in you to lead us, to guide us, to protect us, to sustain us, to comfort us. And we know, dear God, that you are the only one that can do such. May your words be a blessing to many, and we are thankful for this divine privilege. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen and amen. All right. We are in the book of Hebrews. And I ask of you to turn with me to the chapter will be number 12. And we want to read from verse number 22 to verse number 24. Hebrews chapter number 12, verses 22 to verse number 24. And it reads, But you are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. I want to talk on the subject pertaining to the new covenant or the new testament. We have spent so many times in the old covenant, but I want to address certain things that 
the New Testament have highlighted that we need not to ignore but pay close attention to. And one of the things mentioned in Hebrews chapter 12, especially when you look at verse number 24, it says, And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. And that's the first thing I want us to really identify, that Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant or the new testament. Now, who is a mediator? One who intervenes between two, either in order to make or restore peace and friendship, or to form a compact or for ratifying a covenant. In other words, anyone who serves as that go-between has a very important role and a specific purpose to fulfill. Especially when it comes to, to form a compact and agreement, it means that both parties must be in sync with each other. When you talk about ratifying a covenant, giving confirmation to such an agreement, it means that at the end of what is being said, both parties must be able to agree. So, mediator is also a medium of communication. An arbitrator, in other words, every mediator, whoever acts as mediator, does not belong to one party, but to two or more. In your Bibles, you can look at Galatians chapter number 3 and verse number 20, and it says, Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. In other words, a go-between is not a go-between of one, but God is one. We know that God is one, and we know for a fact that whoever God communicates with is for the benefit of the persons with whom he is communicating. But because we had a problem of sin that separated between man from God, sin was the means by which we could not have that direct communication. Remember Isaiah, the one who said in chapter 59, Verse 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is air heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So that separation between mankind and God was sin. And there was no communication, and there was no go-between to give us that connection between ourselves and God. So there have to be someone who would stand in that gap, someone who God is pleased with to mediate on our behalf and to allow that connection to go through. And because there was no one to be found that can be pure, that can have that um, form of, of, of being without guile, of being righteous, because there was no man on the earth that could really do that except the one whom God approved of. And that's where we come in to learn about Jesus. So, so Jesus would be the go-between, the mediator. Because he's the one when he died on the cross for our sins, gave us the opportunity now to have access to God. But the only way we can have access to God is through him. We cannot get to the Father through any other means but through Jesus Christ. Remember John chapter 14 uh, verse number 6, Jesus did say, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man can get unto the Father but by me. When it comes to salvation, Acts chapter 4, verse number 12, neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So, Jesus is that mediator. But to understand that even more, I want us to see the role that Moses would have taken in the Old Covenant to show what he did as being the mediator between God and the children of Israel. Because the Bible will tell us, if you look at Galatians chapter 3, and before we read, I want to just say that when we talk about immediate in regards to Moses, it is used of Moses, the one who brought the commands of God to the people of Israel and acted as mediator with God on behalf of the people. Galatians chapter 3, verse number 18, and I'm going to read all the way to verse number 20 in the basic Bible English. It says, because if the heritage is by the law, or if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer dependent on the word of God. But God gave it to Abraham by his word or by promise. Remember, going back to what I said, that God made a promise to Abraham that through his seed, 
all nations of the earth will be blessed and through a particular seed to come through his lineage which is Christ that we'll be able now to be part of God's people part of God's kingdom part of God's fold verse 19 what then is the law it was an addition made because of sin till the coming of the seed to whom the undertaken had been given and it was ordered through angels by the hand of a go-between or a mediator and that's when he comes and he says again in verse 20 now a go-between is not a go-between of one but god is one so how do we know that moses further was that mediator between god and the children of israel deuteronomy chapter number five the scripture says in verse number four and five the lord talked with you face to face in the mount of the midst of the fire this is what moses said and then verse five i stood between the lord and you at that time to show you the word of the lord i stood between you remember a mediator is a go-between someone who puts themselves in a position between two parties to be able to communicate and that's what moses did so moses in the old testament is the mediator for israel as they come before the presence of god uh-huh that being said we know god is one therefore this disagreement cannot be in him which would be in the case of the lord disannulled the promise both being given by him in other words the law was given yes it comes from the source which is god the promise was given it came from the source which is god the promise was given to abraham in genesis chapter 12 the law was given in exodus, exodus chapter 19 and if you look at it carefully both came from god but with the promise that God made, because God does not lie, it doesn't matter that the law was added because of transgression, the promise remained committed to the cause. So while the law was there to chastise, but the law was there to really put God's people in a, in a situation whereby when you break it, hear the consequences of the law, it did not stop the promise from being fulfilled. So Moses now being the mediator, he was the mediator to go between between israel and god making sure that the promise that god made to abraham would have been kept as well as the law that god gave to israel would also be kept christ is called mediator between god and mankind since he interposed by his death and restored the harmony between god and man which human sin had broken i go to hebrews chapter 9 again verse number 15 and verse number 16 where the scripture says in the basic bible english and for this cause it is through him that a new agreement that come into being so that after the errors under the first agreement had been taken away by his death the word of god might have effect for those who were marked out for an eternal inheritance so those who committed sins under the old covenant when jesus died on the cross he did not only cover the sins of those who were present at that time but it covered the sins of those who were in the past under the old system of things and it also covered the sins of those in the future because we were not there when christ died we were not even there when christ came but our sins that we continue to commit has already been covered by jesus christ when he died on the cross so his death went in the past in the present and the future to cover all of mankind's sins that's why he says in verse number 16 because where there is a testament or a will there has to be the death of the man who made it could you imagine uh, if you go back to the, uh, the, 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 the example of the, par, um, the prodigal son, if you go back to that example in Luke chapter 15, from verse number 11, remember these two sons, the younger and the older. The younger son wanted the inheritance from his father before his father died. That would have been disrespectful to ask, you know, Father, give me what you have in store for me before I die. Give me what you have written on in your will, in your testament. That would have been very much disrespectful to the father but the father still gave to his son what was due to him so really a testament is enforced a will is enforced after someone dies so you know for a fact that you have certain things you want to give to your children and you make out that will and testament is not in effect until you die and so it is jesus by his death on the cross had replaced the old covenant and the new testament came into being 
That's why he is now the mediator. So Moses, who was the mediator between Israel and God, that system is now replaced. That system is now removed because it was only for Israel, but, but Jesus is the mediator for mankind. That now is extended to everyone who's Jew, who's Gentile, who's Scythian, who's barbarian. Doesn't matter whether you're black or white. Jesus is the mediator. And therefore, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, from verse number 1, when Paul was writing pertaining to certain things that should be identified and take place in the church, he talked about prayers and he said, you know, I exhort therefore that first of all supplication, prayers, intercession, given of time be made for all men. I, was, I just want to keep with the context of what we're doing for kings and for all that in authority and that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godness and honesty. So pray for those that are your leaders. Don't just pray for, you know, those who are among the members but pray for those who are leaders pray for those who are leading the country those who are not even in the body of christ you pray for individual for this is good and acceptable in the sight of god why who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth so god's desire is to save all men or mankind but that can only be made possible with a mediator that has been in the position to help serve all of us. And that's why verse number 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator, one go-between, between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So when the scripture says there is one mediator, I want to be specific and abundantly and profoundly and explicitly clear. One mediator doesn't mean two. Whatever religious belief system you have, whatever religious organization you belong to, if Jesus Christ is not the one mediator, then you cannot receive the benefits or the blessings that are supposed to come to those who believe in God Almighty and who believe in Jesus Christ as his son, and who believe in the Holy Spirit, and who identify Jesus Christ as one mediator. Because sometimes you may use a religious book, or a book that has some kind of religious guidance, according to your culture, according to your history, and in that particular book, it may not have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but it may have someone else that may perhaps be a mediator between the God that you believe and, and, and that individual who come to serve between you and that God. Now that's according to your religious book. That's according to what you believe. But as long as you believe in the Bible, as long as you believe in the word of God, as long as you believe in that which we hold fast to, there's only one mediator. And there's no one else to come after Christ, as some are alluding to, in their own writings, in their own additional books that they want to, to put alongside the Bible, that someone comes after Christ. There's no other prophet than Christ. He is the last and final prophet. There's no other individual or religious icon to come after Christ. So no, we cannot say that this person is a mediator or that person is a mediator or this individual. We cannot say that. Why? Because the Bible says there's only one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus. If there was another name to put, it would be there. And that's the reason why some people would exclude the writings of Paul. Because the writings of Paul enforces the fact that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Enforces the fact that Jesus Christ is God. Enforces the fact that he is the only mediator between God and men. So if you remove certain writings from Paul in particular, and you want to continue with the rest of the Bible, you will still have to make the conclusion that Moses made. In Deuteronomy chapter 18 from verse 19. And the same conclusion that you would find even that Peter made if you don't like Paul. In Acts chapter number 3 you know, from verse 19. Because the Bible tells us. Moses truly said. The prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you. Like unto me your brethren. Him shall he hear in all things whatsoever shall say unto you. It shall come to pass that every soul that will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. So even Moses spoke of somebody to come that is just like him. And when Jesus when he came... Wow. He mentioned what Moses said. If you had listened to Moses, then you should have listened to me. Because Moses was the mediator between God and the Israelites. But Jesus is the mediator between God 
and mankind. Now, if you're not too clear on why I said that you need to listen to Jesus and not Moses, it is he who, with reference to mankind, mediates or guarantees for, for them a new and better covenant. And, and that is only understood with Jesus, who is also and appears in the scripture to be our high priest. That's why he supersedes Moses. You see, Moses was not a high priest. Moses was not the savior of the world. Moses was not the mediator for mankind. So when you look at Hebrews chapter number 3, the scripture says from verse number 1, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle, get this now, and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, the anointed one, the Messiah, Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. So when you look at Moses and you look at Jesus, yes, Moses was called to deliver the children of Israel from Egyptian slavery and bondage. Yes, Moses was given the Ten Commandments and the laws and all the things that were supposed to go to the children of Israel. Yes, Moses was leading the church in the wilderness. Yes, Moses was faithful. But when you look at Jesus Christ, the scripture says in verse number 3, for this man was counted more worthy or counted worthy of more glory than Moses inasmuch as he who had built the house had more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. The children of Israel were already in existence as a nation for Moses to lead as their mediator. But Jesus is the one who built his house, coming from the book of Isaiah chapter 2 from verse 2 to 4, when God said he would build his house and his house would be established on top of the mountains, above the hill. The house of which he's referring to is the house of God. And Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The house of God is the church of the living God. First Peter chapter 3 and verse number 15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou ought to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. So when Moses is being spoken of here and Jesus is being spoken of here in the scriptures, verse 5 says of Hebrews chapter 3, and Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. So Moses was just like a shadow, just like the Old Testament was a shadow of good things to come. Because as he led the children of Israel, as he delivered them, as he provided and sustained and gave them the Lord, so too when Christ came, who is the seed that Galatians talks about in chapter 3 from verse 19 following, when he came... He was supposed to supersede what Moses did. And he did that. So verse number 6 of Hebrews 3. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence of the boldness and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Moses was compared to with Christ, being faithful, being the one who was the deliverer, being the one who helped the children of Israel, he kept them together as a nation of Jews. But Jesus, Jesus has always been faithful. Jesus has always been our deliverer. Jesus has always been our savior. So when he came upon the face of the earth, all the things that were spoken of him by the prophets to come and fulfill and do, it was already set in mind, cast in stone, and it would be done when he came upon the face of the earth. So Galatians chapter 4 verse 4. When the fullness of time has come. God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. Yes. Why? To redeem them that were under the law. That we might receive the adoption of son. So Christ as a son over his own house. Whose house are we? He's the mediator between God and mankind. Let me just go over to the fact that we talk about his priesthood just now. And I want to elaborate on that a little bit. In Hebrews chapter 7 verse number 20 following he says this. And as this is not without the taking of an oath. For those were made priests without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath. By him who says of him the Lord gave his oath. Which he will not take back. You are a priest forever. Hold on. All priests that serve under the uh, Levitical system. They had a time, they had a purpose, but their priesthood was not eternal. 
which means that as one priest lived and served, so he would die. But this priest in which we are talking about, this priest is known as the high priest. We saw in Hebrews chapter 3, verse number 1. This priest has an eternal priesthood. This priest has an unchangeable priesthood. Hebrews chapter 7, verse number 12. And so this is the reason why when an oath was made that he's going to be our high priest, our eternal priest, our everlasting priest, that would not change. So verse 22, by so much is it a better agreement which we have through Jesus. For verse 23 says, and it is true that there have been a great number of those priests because death does not let them go on forever. But this priest, in verse 24, because his life goes on forever is unchanging. That's why I said we have an unchangeable priesthood where Christ is concerned. So anyone who is in the body of Christ due to obedience to the gospel are part of an unchangeable priesthood. There is not any removal of our condition or our position except we compromise that with our sinful life. And I often would say the day that you obey the gospel of Christ and you became a Christian, you are a Christian until you die, heading to eternity. You could become disobedient, you could become unfaithful, you could become unclean, but you still have an opportunity to be cleansed, to be washed, to be sanctified, because you are a Christian until the day you die, heading to eternity. So I'm saying this now to all Christians who have gone astray, who have fallen, who have erred. It's not too late to come back to the body of Christ because Jesus Christ is still our mediator. He's still our mediator. And, and verse number 25 of uh, Hebrews chapter number 7, so that he is fully able to be the savior of all who come to God through him because he ever living to make prayer to God for them. In other words, he's ever living to make intercession for them. So if he's ever living to make intercession for his people, it means that he is the go-between forever. He is the go-between without end. And so, Jesus is the mediator of the New Testament or the New Covenant. Because he's the everlasting high priest and there's no change with his priesthood, let me just mention one more thing. The, the, the New Covenant, the New Testament, is an everlasting covenant. The same way we have an everlasting priesthood, the same way we have an unchangeable priesthood, the same way we have a, a high priest who continues to live forever, the, the, the covenant that we are under is also everlasting. The old covenant had its limitation. The old covenant had its time. But the new covenant is everlasting. Matthew chapter 26 and verse number 20, 28, when Jesus was instituting the Lord's Supper, he says, for this is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for many for the remission of sins. If you didn't understand what I just said, let me repeat something very carefully for you. This is my blood of the New Testament. You see, I'm going to talk about something a little later, past in, in another lesson, but he says, this is my blood in the New Testament. You see, in the Old Testament, the blood of bulls and calves were there to do something, but my blood is the blood of the New Testament. And this is shed for many. Why? That they can have forgiveness or remission of sins. So therefore, when I look at this everlasting covenant that we are under today, let's look at the comparison. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 28 to verse number 29. I read in the basic Bible English, it says, A man who has gone against the law of Moses is put to death without pity on the word of two or three witnesses. So the King James Version would say, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy on the two or three witnesses. But verse 29, But will not the man by whom the Son of God has been crushed underfoot, and the blood of the agreement, or the blood of the covenant, which is the New Testament, with which he was washed and cleansed, has been taken as an unholy thing, and who has had no respect for the spirit of grace, be judged bad enough for a very much worse punishment. In other words, under Moses' law, you die without mercy under two or three witnesses. 
So then carefully think about under the new covenant, if I have taken what Jesus had done for me when he died on the cross, if I trodden underfoot the Son of God, if I took the blood by which I am sanctified, the blood of the new covenant, the blood of the new agreement, the blood of this testament, by which I am sanctified, if I make that to be an unholy thing, it means that my punishment will be sore than that which is of old covenant. Because I'm taking something that which God had washed and sanctified and made me clean, and guess what I'm doing with it? I'm treating it as dirt, as filth, as nothing. So if you're under the new covenant, the new testament, by which the blood of Christ is very much active, then you no longer have to do the things under the old covenant. What things? Eating of pork, having plural wives, using instrumental music, keeping the Sabbath, we went through all of those things. We no longer have the obligation to follow those things because we are under an everlasting covenant which is the New Testament. And to confirm again or to ratify what I just said, there will be no doubt, Hebrews chapter number 13, verse 20 and verse 21. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Brother Wendell didn't say that by saying is my inspired words. No. It is written by the Hebrew writer to, to teach us that we have the blood of the everlasting covenant because it comes from the great shepherd of the sheep, Jesus. And what does it do? Make you perfect. Make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing. In his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever, and let the church say, Amen. So we have an everlasting covenant because we have an everlasting mediator. We have an everlasting and unchangeable priesthood. So there are more benefits in Christ under the new covenant than the old covenant. Under the new covenant, the plan of salvation is clear. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. John 8, 24. If you don't believe that I am here, you will die in your sins. Repent of your sins. Luke 13, 3 and 5. If you don't repent, you will also die in your sins. Confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Because when you confess with your mouth, it is unto salvation. You're not saved yet. In Acts chapter 2, verse number 38, Peter's response to those people who ask the question, what shall we do? He says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you are following the Old Testament, and you're keeping the Sabbath and tithe and instrumental music and all such like things, you are not following the New Testament as you should, and you should not merge the two, because Jesus is the mediator of the New Testament. Even Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 6, we are able ministers of the New Testament. There is where we have salvation. There is where we are sanctified and justified in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So when you obey the gospel of Christ, he will add you to his church. And there you would you have all the benefits and blessings of Christ. I trust that you would have heard and that you are making the move right now to obey the gospel of Christ. So that you will have your soul saved. Let us know of your desire. And may God bless you until we meet again. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe What the Bible tells me I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe That he died on Calvary I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe That he came to set me free in me So I might live with him in glory I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe when the Bible tells me I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe That he died on Calvary, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe That he came to set me free, so I might live with him